Our guest today is a consultant, coach, speaker, and three-time best-selling author on a mission to simplify sales. His business passion is helping companies, sales teams, and individual salespeople win more new sales. And his specialties are new business development and sales management. He has become one of the most trusted and sought-after sales experts in the world today. Known for his blunt, funny, Tell it like it is style and his ability to share simple, practical, power, effective, and easy to implement concepts. There is more demand for his services than his availability. He has spoken and consulted on five continents and has been named the number one sales expert to follow on Twitter. He's the proud dad of three young adult children, and he's married to his high school sweetheart, Katie. Mike Weinberg, welcome to the Champion Forum podcast. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for the generous words and uh, excitement. It's great to be with you and your audience. Well, I, I will tell you, uh, I had to put my sales skills to the test because I've been wanting you on this show for a long time. Uh, you are talked about at the water cooler. I come from the corporate uh, Fortune 500 space. I spent many, many years in sales. And as I would ask colleagues, hey, who would you like to have on the show? Mike Weinberg mm -hmm. kept coming up and I just read it in, in your, in the intro, you have more to do than time to do it. So I got to tell you, listener, I proved my sales ability by getting Mike on the show. I did not let go push through some resistance, but Mike, it's, it's an honor, truly an honor to have you. Oh on my the gosh. Show. All right, that's enough. That's, that's that I, I give you great credit. <laughs> we, we reject most requests just because we're running hard and I'm trying to focus on, you know, We'll talk about productivity at some point during this episode because every sales leader, every executive is a little overwhelmed, right? Sure. And the key is sometimes you just got to say no, even though you hate to do that. Sure. But you want us over. So I salute you and your sales <laughs> effort. And there I'm we glad go. we know each other now. It's fun. It's fun getting to know you. And I look forward to this conversation. No doubt about it. So obviously the listener has heard your bio. Many of them listening already know who you are. But maybe you could tell us before we get into the meat of the interview, tell us a little bit about your background. What was what was that journey like getting to international speaker and best-selling author? I'm assuming they didn't just set you on the mountaintop. Yeah, I, I don't even know if I'm on a mountaintop, but I'm kind of scared of heights. So <laughs> that may feel, uh, affect my answer. You know, I'm a sales guy. And this was not some grand plan. Like I never set out to do this. Uh, didn't expect it, didn't plan for it. Uh, I was a sales guy, got really good at hunting, set myself apart as a guy that figured out how to bring in, you know, net new business, ended up in consulting, kind of liked it, had a little run at it, played around until it kind of wore me out. And then went back to be a sales, sales leader, sales executive and learned how hard that was really. Uh, and that was formative in my, in my career. And that's what put me on the path of trying to master sales management. Because once I got in an executive and management role, I realized how different it was from being a salesperson. And if you fast forward to about 10 years ago, I kind of got tired of working in, in difficult environments and for some people that really didn't know where they wanted to take their business. And I thought, I'm going to go back out on my own and I'm going to do consulting. I'm going to do coaching. I'll figure out how to be a speaker a little bit. But I knew I, I could help salespeople sell more. And I launched this form of my business in early 2011, walked away from a very uh, nice paying job as a sales leader. And I launched a business because I wanted to go back to what I love, which is helping salespeople and sales teams win more new sales. And I mostly did it at that point by helping the sales team. But very quickly in this round of, of, of my business, I figured out by banging my head against the wall that if you don't deal with the leadership stuff, culture, accountability, compensation, talent management, all those big pieces around, around leadership and, and sales management. Sales training doesn't do much for the, for the long term. Mm -hmm. So between my own stumbles and bumbles in sales management after being a super high producing salesperson and then learning, really getting some serious consulting and coaching engagements that I better address the leadership piece. That's kind of what put me on the path that I've been on. And in terms of the books, I knew I'd have a book on selling because I had good content. I'd been told that for a long time and I wanted to kind of codify what I was doing on my own and teaching salespeople, but I wasn't really ready to do a book. And then in that first summer, I was out in my business. It was the summer of 2011. Two different publishers contacted me and said, hey, we're, we're, we're looking at your blog and social media was getting a pretty good footing at this point. And I was getting a following 
with a little blog and I got connected to some of the giants in, in the sales world, like Anthony Anarino and mm-hmm. Jill Conrath. And they were sharing my content. So my following was growing and I'm forever thankful to those people for their, their support. Mm-hmm. And I got contacted by these two publishers and they're like, you know, you write really well and you kind of have a contrarian point of view. Why don't you do a book? Hmm. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do a book. And they had me write a proposal. And one of the publishers laughed at me. I mean, laughed at my speaking <laughs> calendar. And I was not willing to commit to buying 10,000 books. And, and the other publisher was the American Management Association's nonprofit publisher called Amicom. And they do some amazing business books. And they're like, here you go. Here's a contract. Let's do this book and we'll help you. And that was New Sales Simplified. Yeah. And nobody knew what would happen, including me nor my family. And, you know, today, here we are eight years later, it's, you know, on every list of top five sales books ever. So yeah. there wasn't a plan. Right. Well, and when you have a book like that, that explodes, things change for you and you, you get more opportunity. So that's kind of the path. But at the end of the day, I'm always reminding my audience or when I'm leading a workshop or when I'm consulting, I'm a sales guy yeah. who was amazing at selling, struggled as a sales leader, went back to figure it out. And I've spent the last 10 years, you know, embedded in companies, seeing what works and what doesn't. And I've kind of corn kind of carved out this little corner of the world for myself as the sales improvement guru guy who's going to tell you the truth, even if you don't like it. And I'll make fun of the people in our industry that have, that are preaching a lot of nouveau nonsense and making up stuff because they have an agenda. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to be me. Yeah. And my passion is helping sales teams and salespeople win more new sales. So that's the background. That's how we got here. And I'm just having a lot of fun, man. You know, that's, it's amazing. You know, it's the adage of, uh, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get, Mm -hmm. you know, who knew that, uh, you know, your books, uh, especially the first book was going to do what it did. But I love that. I love your, your willingness to take the risk because much like my story, Mm -hmm. and I haven't read a best selling book yet. uh, But much like your story, I had this passion, but I had to leave behind something to, to take that risk. And you're doing that. And it's making big, big impact. But that's a good segue into uh, the first question. Obviously, this is, uh, as we mentioned in some emails, this is primarily a leadership podcast, but we do have a lot of salespeople that listen in, given my background. But I saw saw an interview that you did uh, that that, that said that you didn't originally want to write Sales Management Simplified, which is geared towards sales leaders. And I wanted to ask you, why, why is that? Uh, and what convinced you to write it? And I think you might've already touched on this a little bit about, you know, you can have all the training in the world, but if you don't have leadership, but I'd like to get your thoughts around that. Um, what you didn't really want to write it, but you were compelled. What led you to write the book? That's a great question. You know, I, I didn't need to write it because I had so much demand from new sales simplified and I, my plate was super full. Um, I was compelled to write it because I kept getting called into companies. And for those of you that aren't seeing this on video or just listen on audio, I'm doing some air quotes. I was, I was called in the companies to help the leaders, the owner, the president, the head of sales fix their sales problem in quotes. And I'll tell you that 90% of the time, once I really dug in, I ended up back in the owner, if it's a privately held company or the president or the senior sales leader's office and said, hey, I found a big part of the challenge. And I had to hold up a mirror and go, it's you. It's your culture. It's the way you demean your people. It's your stupid compensation plan. And it's the (laughs) fact that you bury your salespeople in all kinds of crap and don't let them sell. And yet you're frustrated. They don't have enough sales activity and things like that, where I felt like I need to hold up the mirror and say, this is what I'm seeing. And what's so interesting in, in sales manager simplified, the book is really simple. It's got two parts. Exactly one half of the book is all of my stories and, and anecdotal observations of the total dysfunction in sales management everywhere I go. And there are real stories about real companies and real sales leaders in there on all the sales management sins. And the second half of the book is a very simple framework for how to become an outrageously effective sales manager or sales executive to focus on the very few basics that move the needle. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to write the book at first because I was crazy busy and swamped. And then there was a part of me that honestly cringed when I got this book published because I knew that I was going to piss off a bunch of people reading the first half of that book. (laughs) And whether it was the people I was writing about, and they're all anonymous, right? The handful of them know who they are, but that no one else would know. 
or it was sales managers who read it and like, oh my gosh, he's telling, he's describing me yeah. or my company. And honestly, the most common reaction I get when somebody really wants sales help to fix something on their sales team, if they have read sales management simplified, very typically the first thing they say is, I feel like you were following us around for two years <laughs> because we see ourselves in all of those chapters. And I, and I can say that because and now that I've done consulting on five continents and seen sales leaders all over the world, the truth is everyone is struggling with the same things. Yeah. Like the sales management challenges, they're not like similar, they're identical. Mm -hmm. And whether I'm in St. Louis where I'm sitting right now or San Diego or Spain or South Africa or Sao Paulo, I mean, a lot of other places that begin with S, I see the same sales management challenges. So yeah. that's what finally compelled me to write is someone needed to say the truth. And I was comfortable enough in my own skin that I'm just going to call it like it is. And little did I know that that book, I mean, it's the, it's the most reviewed pure sales manager book on the market. And that honestly is what drives most of my business now because, and this is why we're going to have this conversation yes. and why I was so excited to talk to you because as goes the leader, mm -hmm. so goes the team. No and the doubt. leader's the key. The leader is the key yeah. to the culture and to long-term results, period. Yeah. There, there is no question. I tell leaders all the time, you know, cause I, I get it. I get the opportunity to get under the hood with businesses and see the, the behind the scenes and sales function is obviously a big part of business, but so many times these leaders will either have a, a great product, a great service, a great uh, sales training, a great fill in the blank. But if you don't have leadership to drive that it, it, it doesn't go anywhere. It's like having a Lamborghini sit in the driveway or a Porsche 911, if you will, uh, sit in the driveway and it looks beautiful, but there's no engine inside. It's not moving anywhere. And leadership is that. And I, I applaud you for writing the book because quite frankly, again, to your point, we could deliver all the goods and check the boxes. And look, I came from a very large sales organization. Mm. And I will tell you, the playbook was the same from the East Coast to the West Coast. And it always begged the question of, well, why isn't everybody performing the same way then? And it boiled down typically to one major thing, which was leadership. Mm. And that is a big opportunity. Now, in your book, a substantial amount of your book it, uh, sales management simplified focuses on building healthy cultures, healthy sales cultures. What are some signs that that you're that an organization, or or maybe even from your point of view, Mike, what you're seeing out there? What are some of these signs that a company has an unhealthy sales culture, and what are the characteristics of a healthy one? If somebody is maybe naive and listening, what are those signs that you're seeing? Yeah, that's a dangerous question. Jeff, I, I, isn't it? Yeah. But because it's, I, here's what I didn't know going into this, because I worked in some incredibly healthy sales cultures as a young man, in, including one place that had the best sales culture I'd ever seen until I ran into that company I wrote about in, in chapter 18 in the book, where they had everything in one place. It was like, it was like holy ground when I walked into that company. And I'll talk about that healthy culture in a minute, but unhealthy cultures are more common than I realized. And it's, it's everything from high ego executives that demean the sales function. I see that a lot in technology companies or engineering type firms where they're so proud of their product or their process or their patents that they think that's what sells it. So they don't have a lot of respect for the salespeople. Um, I see companies that beat the crap out of the salespeople when business is tough, but when things are good, they take the credit and give it to somebody else. That's, mm -hmm. that's very interesting, that's unhealthy. I see companies that, that jack around with territories or compensation excessively mm -hmm. and do things like take random commission deductions and make salespeople fight to get the money that they earned. That's pretty anti-sales, if you ask me, yeah. uh, an unhealthy culture. I see organizations where the managers are, are kind of part-time managers. So they partially lead the team, but partially are self-focused on their own business, their own portfolio, their own revenue. The Sometimes player coach. They, yeah, player coach, selling manager. Yeah. Sometimes they even end up competing with their own people. I mean, think about the distrust and, mm -hmm. and culture damage that creates. Um, I see companies where they use this. Uh, this is very common on some of the clients I have now. They use the salespeople as free labor. Oh, you know, we're a little short in the plant. They send a couple of those sales guys out there, help them move mm -hmm. those boxes around. Mm -hmm. Or in the more typical way, the company short on service in the service department. So mm -hmm. 
the, some of the industrial salespeople end up running into the office or into the uh, parts department to grab some parts a customer needs and will drive 60 miles to the other side of their territory to deliver a $50 part. Mm. And, and, and the management think that's great because they're saving some delivery fee. And I'm like, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. You just I think a you're guy. getting some nerves here, Mike. These are real things. These are real things. So all of those, it's where there's a disrespect for the sales function, the sales manager, because some of it shows up where the company treats the sales manager like the garbage dump. And I write about that in sales management, simplify where every problem gets dumped on the sales manager's desk. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how is that helping them lead the team and drive revenue if you're if they have to deal with every issue in the company? So those things collectively really damage culture. And and it's it's you know, the guy that I really respect, his name was Robert Klein. He's he's still his, his name is Robert Klein. He was my client, and it was his company that I described in chapter 18. And I mean, I knew I'd have a book on sales management at some point. I didn't realize that the chapter on a healthy culture would basically be a description of one company. Because, and I'll just throw some of the characteristics out there. I walk in this place and the moment I set foot in there, I'm like, this is sales heaven. Everywhere I turned, there was a whiteboard with a contest or a mm -hmm. sales ranking. And I got to sit in the CEO's office and watch him show me how he stretched his salespeople and pushed them on business planning and stretch goals. And I heard about how they recruit and the, the hurdles they made candidates jump through to even get a sniff at an opportunity to work there because they were so protective of the winning culture that they had. I watched them go to their team meetings mm -hmm. where not only was it fun and laughter and celebration, but oh my gosh, they took role play and practice to a level. I had never seen it before. It was so serious and so strong that I was almost uncomfortable <laughs> until I realized that their, their motto was, hey, we don't lose. So when we practice, we practice for real, like with pads on. So if you come to the sales team meeting, we're practicing how to overcome this objection or introduce this new product and you, and you screw up in front of the sales team, we're going to beat you up in a fun way. And we're going to practice till we get it right. Because when we go out in the field, we're going to win. So it was a combination of team meetings, celebration. They had just taken the whole company. This is like 10 years ago. They took the whole company out to the Rolling Stones concert in Philadelphia, wow. spent wow. gazillion dollars, right? because they were celebrating their sales success. So loud, fun, people oriented, uh, really protective of their culture as they recruit, pro sales, pro high earning. I, I want salespeople to make a fortune as long as they're earning it, not on a commission annuity, right? As long as you're earning it. Right. And, and stretch goals and real accountability and real coaching. And I mean, it, it was, when you get that environment, oh you know it yeah. and you can't, and it, it's rare. I mean, it's, it's a rare thing to see something that special. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully listeners are identifying with some of this and they're saying, uh oh, that's me. Um, and maybe you're doing the scorecard on yourself right now. What's working? What's not? What do we need mm -hmm. to fix? I, I bet too, Mike, there's those that are like, hey, so and so needs to hear what Mike just said, right? There's going to be some of that too. I had the privilege of working in the culture you described, the latter culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is amazing. It's great to have those benchmarks too, especially in the world I'm living in now, because I know how it's supposed to be. And But it's not always done that way. Some of it is can't do, some of it is won't do. Uh, but either way, we have to understand that this, these, if we're going to embrace sales, we got to truly embrace sales because it's the bloodline of our organizations for the most part. The trigger that you pulled on, that, that you really hit on me was that uh, putting them back in service. This is probably, not probably, one of the biggest mistakes that I see. This is, uh, you're looking at a guy that came from service and went into sales. So I knew how to do service, but now I'm in full-time sales. And when things got short, things got hairy, they could always reel me back in. And we got to be so careful of these things. Your book outlines very, very well on what to do, what not to do, what are the pitfalls. So I, I think it, it goes without saying that we have to be self-aware. We can't be naive because the PL doesn't tell the whole story. You might be doing really good on the PL, but it begs the question of how good could you be if you start doing the things that Mike displays in the book? Oh my gosh, Jeff, it's so powerful. I want to go back to something you just said. I'm going to interview you now sure. because, because I deal with this all the time. And I can't believe I get paid to tell executives this, but the number one reason we don't, we don't bring in more sales, especially new sales, right? Real cross sell, real upsell or real new logos is, is not because of selling skills. It's because the salespeople don't spend any time working on it. 
Mm-hmm. And some of that is the salesperson's bent and their habit of defaulting to serving and babysitting their favorite customers, which makes often makes them a lot of money, right? Because it's a big account needs to be served. But the other reason we don't spend enough time selling is what you said. And I'm curious for your take on this because management loses sight of the salesperson's primary job, which is to create new revenue, mm-hmm. not to play territory caretaker or maintenance guy, right? But it's so easy to view that salesperson as, oh, look, he's got a car, he's got a company truck, or he sure. send him out there, send her on the little trip to go take care of this customer service problem. But my question for you is, I mean, what's the opportunity cost? What are, what are we not accomplishing pipeline and growth wise, right? I mean, what, what's your take on that? Because it seems so tempting that mm-hmm. it, whether it's free labor or it's just, it's easy to, hey, send them to put the fire out. It really is, especially if you have operational leaders that have never carried the sales bag, then it gets really interesting, right? And this isn't like we're beating up on ops today, right? But it is a real opportunity. I would tell you, I always would tell leaders, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Oh. Yes, you can have sales run the, you know, the, the, the product out or whatever it might be, but there's a cost of doing something and there's a cost of not doing something. And as leaders, we have to really weigh out what those things are. And this is across the line, whether it's a, you know, your best sales performer or the C player, because at the end of the day, they're in that sales function for a reason. Now, there's the other side of this coin, too, where you have salespeople that are looking for those outs. And it could be because of lack of confidence. It could be because lack of development, whatever it might be. And they're going to use this as an excuse because they're not meeting their their projections or whatever it might be. So there's two sides to that coin. But at the end of the day, um, yes, a matter of fact, I would tell you the best salespeople are looking for opportunity to extend the olive branch and uh, get people to work for them that don't report to them by doing these things. But it should be an exception and not the rule. And we have to safeguard that regardless of staffing in service or whatever it might be. And we've got to see the long game. Jeff, I mean, that, that last couple of minutes that people need to go back and rewind what you just said. I, I 100% endorse where you're going with that. And it lines up exactly with what, what I see across all industries. And I'll just, I'll add two points to that. Number one, to the people that think Jeff and I are crazy and telling you that we don't need to care about customer service and crap on your customers and salespeople should never jump in and put out a fire. We didn't say that. No, He, he just said it. It's, it just becomes a habit. It's when we overdo it and we default to it. We should absolutely care for the customer and we don't want to drop the ball. And every once in a while, there's the key phrase, every once in a while, the salesperson jumping in with a fire extinguisher to, to, to douse the flames and, and jump in to save the day is, is smart. But what happens is it becomes a crutch and you, and you want to know why you don't have more sales. It's because you're using your salespeople as that crutch. So occasionally it's okay, but there are salespeople, and Jeff, you said this so beautifully, that are weaker or more relational, and and they look for those opportunities to come play service person. They think, I'm doing my job. I'm working 60 hours. Everybody loves me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except you're not moving the needle on sales. That's right. Because you're you're playing glorified customer service rep. So so there's that issue. And then there's just the danger. I think you you started to go down the path of when the operations person, right, is driving it. Mm -hmm. And I see this because I have a lot of clients that are dealers or distributors or have branches. When the same person is in charge of sales and operations, Mm. it's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Because because they, uh, my take, I'm curious your take, they always default to the operational issues because the the fire that's burning, the delivery that's not made, the customer with the problem, the the people that didn't show up for work and now the line is down, whatever the operational issue is, that's urgent and it's in your face. So you got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize you have a sales problem until the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And the report comes out and you're like, oh crap, I didn't pay attention to sales. Yeah. So I'm very leery when the ops people are in charge of the salespeople because yeah. they don't, right? What, what's your take on that? I would tell you this, you ha- and it's a wonderful point. I think you have to invest in it. And I think you see it more in small to medium-sized business because of lack of, you know, uh, payroll, mm-hmm. uh, expense budget, right? And so we will do this, but you know, you can, you don't go to Ruth's Chris for pizza <laughs> and uh, nobody would ever dream of doing that. The reason I think we fall into this gap is we, we focus on the short game and the long game is where we win. Sales is the long game and sales is the bloodline of the future growth of your organization. But so many times we will lose sight of the long game and start playing the short game. Sales leaders don't do that. Operational leaders 
absolutely do that. And they're more at risk of doing that if you have sales reporting up to operations because they they become what you said, Mike, which is the free labor. And it's mm. uh, these are cultural things. Mike's talking about it. Mike's seeing it internationally. So take note. Mike, I would like to, if you're open to it, to go a little bit of popcorn style. So what I did uh, leading up to our interview, uh, because we got here based off of my peer groups and colleagues saying, Mike Weinberg's the guy you need on the show. I shot out an email to uh, some of my masterminds and people on my newsletter, a select group of people. And I had a few questions come in, some were repeatable. So I'd like to popcorn a few of them out to you from- I'll, uh, I'll go quick with network. you. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to give you shorter answers. That's great. No, no, no. This is, this is fantastic. Okay. So one of them is on the, uh, on the, uh, the love hate with the CRM. And so in my experience, there's always been this love hate with the CRMs. And, and so often sales reps are using the CRM out of compliance. How can leaders do a better job helping sales reps have the CRM work for them and get them to embrace the CRM? Oh gosh, that's a brilliant question. And I still have a love hate relationship, although it's evolved <laughs> since I wrote the book. Um, because my pet peeve is, and this is, this is my answer and my pet peeve. What drives me crazy is we fake compliance with the CRM and we act like it's what we really want them to use. And then we get the salespeople to use it. And then it's the end of the month or the end of the quarter. And the freaking CFO sends a note to the head of sales is I need this information. So the head of sales turns around and sends an email and a spreadsheet to every salesperson and says, I need you to put all this information in the spreadsheet. And the salesperson goes, are you kidding me? All of this is in the CRM. You've been beating my head against the wall for months that I have to be compliant. I'm finally compliant. I got all my deals updated. Every date is accurate. Everything's in there. And now when you really need information, you send me a spreadsheet that I need to do this redundant work and fill it out. Right. So, I mean, you can see me, I'm not, I'm not even like faking my anger here. Like I'm truly <laughs> frustrated by this. Yeah. So, so, so we need to enforce compliance, but then you need to use the system. Mm -hmm. You can't come back to the salespeople and ask for the information again on a, on a different piece of medium, you know, on a different thing, like a spreadsheet. Right. So, so that's number one. Number two is why don't we design it? And I'm going to quote my friend, Nate Holiday. He's become a dear friend. He was the head of global sales operations for Teradata when they brought me in to do some massive sales management workshops around the globe. And it was so much fun working with them. And he's actually featured as one of the panelists in my sales management simplified video coaching series, because I wanted his input. And, and he had this phrase, he called it the corporate tax. I've never heard anybody else say it. And he said his job, because he was a superstar sales guy that they put into sales ops. And he said, my job is to represent the field. And my internally, I'm always fighting to tell the executives, we have to be very careful about the corporate tax we're putting on our salespeople and all the things we ask them to do. And when, when they rolled out their very customized version of Salesforce, they, they did the work under his direction mm -hmm. to tailor the dashboards and the information so that it actually worked for the business. And they use some of the framework and sales manager simplified about results and then pipeline and then activity as a sales management dashboard. Sure. And some of the interface that they built for the salespeople aligned with how they actually held them accountable. So the system looked like it, sh it was supposed to look not like some generic installation of someone else's company's CRM. Right. So that's the best I could tell you. One, if you're going to use it, then don't ask people for that information again, because it's, you're shooting. Why would I ever comply if you're not going to use my data? And then mm -hmm. two, do the extra work, spend a little money and set the thing up so it aligns with how we do business and I can use it. And then I'm happy to use it because I'm a salesperson. I need this information. Otherwise yeah. it's in a notebook yeah. lost on, on my car floor somewhere, right? Which is what we see a lot. And, you know, you, coming from uh, being a sales rep that carried the bag, I could tell you that my love hate with the CRM was there was no immediate gratification in a mm. CRM. And we're <laughs> I don't want to clump every salesperson into this, but for most of us, we need immediate gratification. And so to Mike's point, like you have to understand the long game to our earlier point. So if you're a sales rep out there, uh, one, embrace the tool that you've been giving and let it work for you, right? But also if you're in that leadership role, make it easy for the salespeople to do, because I can tell you all my years of uh, being in sales, this has been a constant hurdle that had to be jumped, no doubt about it. 
So That's Mike, um, another question that came in was around hiring. This came from a leader and I've paraphrased a lot of these, but this came from a leader that had some significant turnover and they wanted to ask you what you felt was the biggest mistake that sales leaders make in hiring. It's, it's hard to come up with the biggest. There are so many, but at the macro level, it's this. We as leaders don't sit back and, and really come up with an honest list of what the job requires and then match the DNA, the wiring of the person to that job. How many times have I been brought into a company that's struggling to bring in net new business and they show me the salespeople, whether it's the assessments of the salespeople or I just watch them and half the population are zookeepers. Hmm. You know, people talk hunters and farmers. I talk hunters and zookeepers because the customer's alive. It's more than farming. It's, it's an animal and it has needs and it poops and someone's got to clean it up and it yeah. gets sick and it has to go to the vet and there's prey coming after it. You got to protect it from, and it's got to be fed. And there's a whole lot of salespeople that are so good at relationship, at technical, at product, at service, at maintaining. That's, a, that's I'm not down on those people. That's an important gift mm -hmm. for an account manager, Sure, but not for a hunter. Right. So I say to them, why do you keep hiring these overly relational people that are experts in your industry who haven't hunted for a thing in their entire life and put them in a hunting role? Mm -hmm. You're going to live perpetually frustrated. So the biggest mistake is not aligning the giftedness of the person with the requirements of the role. In fact, mm -hmm. That's probably the most succinct I ever said it. Not aligning the giftedness of the people with the requirements of the role. Well said. That's, that's number one. The second thing is we just interview terribly. Hmm. We, we fall for people too quickly. We don't ask enough questions. We talk like a sales call. We're supposed to listen like two thirds of the time. I watch some of these managers and executives interview people. They talk 80% of the interview. Mm -hmm. And then they don't ask good open-ended questions that let the salesperson tell stories mm -hmm. and articulate how they were successful in the past and how they're going to approach this job. I mean, one of my favorite interview questions it, when, I'm, when I think someone's for real, I look back at them and I ask them very open-ended questions like, okay, let's, let's assume that you got this job. All right. We hire you. We get you business cards. We get you an email address. We get you orientated for like a week. And then I leave you alone for 60 days. I'm taking a sabbatical. I'm, I'm going to Hawaii. What are you going to do in those 60 days? Hmm. And I tell them, don't answer me quickly. Maybe write down a few things. I really want to see how you're approaching the job and what you think. And I sit back and I let them sit there just like in a good sales call. And I let the silence build. And I thought, I'm serious. Take some notes. I want to hear what are you going to do? And when I come back on day 61, what are you going to brag that you, that you accomplished? Love it. And if the, if the salesperson knows what they're doing, they take a minute and they start writing out a plan about, yeah. I'm going to meet these best customers. I'm going to ask why they love us. I'm going to identify my target list. I'm going to work on my messaging. I'm going to go ask who's happy. I'm going to go see some lost customers and find out why they left us. I'm going to do some prospecting. And you, you hear that and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a real person. Yes. But if they don't have those things to say, they don't know what to do. Yeah. Which leads me to my second favorite question, which is, especially if it's a job that requires some level of new business acquisition, because there are so many fake sales hunters. Oh, yeah. I just look and I go, listen, I want to hear the whole story of the last two big deals you won. And don't start in the middle. I want the whole story from how you created the opportunity all the way through the people you met, the stakeholders, you, the discovery you did, the process, the presenting, the proposing, the negotiating. I want the whole story. Go. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I sit back and don't say a word. And now I'm hearing, does this, has this person won deals before? Do they know? And, and obviously, if you're hiring a junior or rookie person, they can't answer that because it's, right. it's a different kind of job. Yep. But if it's someone who's presenting themselves as a successful new business development salesperson, they better have a track record of having done that before, even if it's in a completely unrelated industry. So yeah. I hope that's helpful. I, I, that's, it, it those does. are my favorite questions. I love it. And that was, uh, that was this person's follow-up question is, what is Mike's favorite questions to ask? And I love the answers to those because here's, here's what I found, especially early in my sales leadership tenure was, I mean, salespeople are trained mercenaries in interviews. They're great at interviewing. <laughs> I mean, they're amazing at interviewing. They got the, the verbiage, they got the, the moxie, they got the charisma, they got the look, they're dressed the part, they got all of this stuff. And so many times leaders can fall prey to that natural ability, you know, that presence, that polish, all of this stuff. And then you find out in 90 days in after orientation and training that they, you were getting painted rust. And these kind of questions- Well, that say that again, said, That's, Mike, I've never heard it said that you're getting painted rust. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. So good. Cause it looks good. Right. When you paint, you paint yeah. rust, it looks like the rest of the car, but it's not going to stay that way. And that's why these interviews are so, so important, especially with salespeople. I love your questions, Mike, because these questions get to the heart of who they are, not what they've done. Well, and there's a I difference. Absolutely. And then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple more because I just had this for a client. Yeah, I had please. to interview two different, two different candidates and, and I was getting near the end. And this one guy just wasn't doing a great job articulating what he could do. And I said to him, this is kind of a, a, an interesting question. I'd never asked it quite this way. I said, Hey, uh, is there something else you wish I would have asked you? Cause I, I didn't feel like he was giving me what I needed. I'm like, is there anything else you wish I would have asked you? And he said, Nope. And then we got near the end of the interview and I'm like, okay. And I sat back like a prospect at the end of a sales call, waiting for him to flesh out objections, ask if I was going to recommend him to my client, his the potential boss, if he was going to define next steps or try to close me. And he didn't do any of that. Hmm. And then I interviewed the next young man. And I, I, I liked the question when the first, with the first guy. So I said to him towards the end, I said, Hey, anything I didn't ask you about that you want to talk about? Because I'm thinking if he was really prepared, he would have, there were things he wanted to say coming in. And he goes, yeah, why don't you ask me how I won that giant deal at Pepsi when I was working for this little $10 million company? And I'm like, hey, why don't you tell me about how you won that giant deal at Pepsi when you were working for this unknown $10 million company? I don't mind if I do. <laughs> and, and he had this incredible story. And then at the end, I said, okay, what are you thinking now? And he, and he looked at me and it was so funny. He goes, so what's my next step? And can I contact you next week? And he didn't ask me, am I going to recommend him to the boss, which I would have loved. But he asked, do you have any concerns with my candidacy? Perfect. Fleshing out objections. And I'm like, I am with a salesperson. I fell yeah. for this guy like this. Yeah. So it's, we don't interview well. It, it's true. If they can't sell you in an interview and show you they know how to run a meeting and sell and flesh out objections and close, and they don't have good success stories, you are talking to the wrong person. No question about Period. it. Period. Yeah. It's so big. And we, you know, sometimes great leaders get a bad rap for having great salespeople because it's like, oh, we could have put anybody in here and they would have won. That's a leadership trait is identifying talent. Make no mistake about it. Um, you got to be really good at doing that. Don't apologize. But I'll say this. Yeah, you need to be great at sales. You got to know a sales process. You got to know marketing and all this stuff to be great at sales. But I'll say this, if there's one area that sales leaders need to go all in on and you can't get wrong and it is unforgiving is bringing the right people onto your team. And you mentioned very early in this question about high skill, um, meaning product knowledge. And I find the industries that have the highest technical need make the biggest mistakes because so-and-so has 20 years putting soldering wires or whatever it might be. And we bring them in. They've never even sold anything. They were in operations in the back, but because they know how to get this wire soldered to that panel, let's bring them in and give it a shot. It rarely works. So great feedback on that, Mike. Um, here's, a, here's another question. And then uh, maybe we'll get into a, a speed round here, but okay. This is a question uh, from a new leader uh, that brought us in, uh, very low tenure. They wanted to ask you uh, about blind spots. They're probably identifying some of their own. They wanted to know, can you tell us about a blind spot of yours that you uncovered in your sales leadership tenure? How did you discover it? And would you have done anything different? Mm. Wow, there's a powerful interview question. Huh? Yeah. My own blind spot that I discovered as a sales leader, probably how poor I am at handling logistics. Hmm. There was a very heavy logistics administrative component to the sales team and the business that I was in in my first sales management job. And it killed me how little the job had to do with leading the people and driving revenue and coaching and doing accountability and how much had to do with basically planning. and it's not my gifting. I mean, I hated every second of it and I was the wrong person to do it. In fact, it was part of the reason the company had such sales challenges is because that's not really a sales management function, but I don't know. It's, um, I, I, I'm going to give a more common one that I, I didn't have too much of this because I was well mentored, but the blind spot I see with a lot of sales leaders is ego. Hmm. And we all have ego and I got plenty of healthy ego and I was a top salesperson. So that's very important as well as a sales, as a, as a manager, but there's this big pivot when you go from being an individual contributor to being a manager 
where you have to learn that it really isn't about you and you don't not, you do not win. You win through your people. It's not your victory. It's their victory. And you can't take the credit and you better not be the hero. In fact, I'm about to do my next podcast will be on whether the sales leader is playing the hero of the team or focused on making heroes of the team members. And there's a whole lot of sales managers who their blind spot is they think they're the hero of the team. And sometimes it's because of ego, but sometimes it's because of insecurity. And sometimes it's because they have insufficient talent and they're just trying to cover for what their people can't do. So instead of coaching them up or coaching them out, they just do their job. Mm-hmm. And, and what happens is in the short term, you can kind of pull it off. You're kind of doing everybody's job and you're closing business for them. But that comes crumbling down at some point. That, that's a house of cards because you're not scaling yourself. You're not multiplying yourself. You're going to burn out. You're going to run off good talent. Like there's a lot of problems with playing the hero, but that's a common blind spot where we were so good as a producer, or even if we haven't been in sales in a while, but we're just the manager and we do instead of coach or we do instead of lead. That's a big blind spot. Man, that is a big one, isn't it? Man, I mean, it's like making me sweat a little bit here on the forehead (laughs) because that was me. Well, I mean, great salesperson, hit the president's clubs, had the awards, you get promoted into leadership and you're not a great leader. Matter of fact, you stink as a leader, but you're good at sales. So you revert back to what you know. And then you realize like this number is way too big for any one person to hit. And I I think you hit the nail on the head, Mike, is, you know, I always tell leaders, you can teach what you know, but you'll reproduce who you are. And if we can do that, like, yeah, we can teach this, teach that, teach the manual, teach, 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 but we have to start reproducing it because if we don't reproduce what we can do as a leader into other people, the projection's too big. Yeah, you did it great as an individual, but now you got to 10 X that you can't do it on your own. And that leads to frustration, not only for you as the leader, but for the entire team. And burnout, frustration, oh. culture killer, and burnout. Why do you think, so? this is the thing. Let's be really honest, Jeff. How many sales leaders and executives do we know are burned out on overload, working 60 hours a week, hundreds of emails a day, can't get it done. And some of their salespeople are on cruise control, mm-hmm. kicking back. Mm-hmm. That is broken. And my heart has really changed where I've become for the sales manager and for the executive because I see their pain because as the coach and consultant, I'm behind the scenes and I see what they're, what they're going through. And part of it is they're doing their people's jobs. Yeah. And it is, it's, a, it's a recipe for burnout it's exhausting. and for, for all kinds of other awful consequences. Yeah. And you surely can't so, scale a career that way. No. Well, we know Mike, the, uh, the, the best-selling author, sales trainer extraordinaire. I would like to introduce the Champion Forum listener to who Mike Weinberg is as a person. So if you have a couple more minutes, can we do a speed round? With yeah, you sure, guys? sure, sure. What's, what's the book that's made the biggest impact on your life? Oh my gosh. Well, when you ask it that way, it's, which is different than the favorite book, I would have to say the Bible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of grace and I'm really thankful and, uh, new Testament opened my eyes. So I would say that has had the biggest impact on me. You and me both, my friend, mm. what's the last song you download? Oh my gosh. Okay. Great song. It's called waking up. It's by a really trendy new group. It's kind of like, I can't even describe the style of music. It's called waking up by we, the kingdom. And it, it has got an amazing sound. I mean, it's, I can't, I can't listen to it enough. It makes me smile every time and makes me think. So, wow. I'm going to okay. check it out. Right, yeah. Waking up. We, the kingdom. Oh, here's one for the salespeople maybe listening. Okay. You just sell the biggest account, the target account that you've been working on for 18 months. You get the ink, you jump in the car. What songs on? Okay. I, <laughs> that's, it depends, but I, I, this is, I'm going to take you in the way back machine. <laughs> when I was dreaming as a young man of getting a Porsche, my first Porsche. I mean, I, my, my, my RA in college, like I was already a Porsche fan as a 20 year old. And the guy who was my RA was like Mr. Porsche. So at the same time, this was like the very late 1980s, Steve Winwood was popular and he had a song called the finer things. And it's not even a great song, but <laughs> when I bought my first Porsche and it was used, it was seven years old and I got a crazy deal on it and from this dealer up in Milwaukee. I, I, and I, the car didn't have any modern like uh, listening. So I had to burn it onto a CD. I brought that song. I burned it from iTunes onto a CD. And that was the first song I played when I got the car. So the finer things. Life is good. I love it. I'm old, dude. This gray hair was earned right here. (laughs) 
<laughs> if you, how about this, Mike? If you could have one superpower, what would it be? What would oh, that superpower be? That's the easiest question you've asked me. Flying. There you go. Yeah, but that's who doesn't want to fly. It's usually yeah. one of two things when I ask. It's flying or invisibility. Yeah, I get. Yeah, both. I would probably do bad stuff if I was invisible. So <laughs> I think I'm better. These people could see you flying, that's right? <laughs> What's your favorite junk food? It's not a junk food, but it is the best food. New York pizza. Oh. I am fat because of New York pizza. Okay? There you go. That is it, the now. If you had to pick one. That you that you would say is at the top of your list. What's the best New York pizza you've eaten? Boy, I can't even do that. I am no, so many. I'm just a New York pizza snob, and living in the Midwest is really hard. The people in Chicago have lost their mind with their acidic tomatoes and chunky fat pizzas. <laughs> and in St. Louis, we have this thing that's like crackers and cheese. It's ridiculous. It's not even the right cheese. Like the pizza, it comes from New York or New Jersey. That's what it should look like. There you go, okay. pizza. There you have it. What is your favorite quote? I don't know that I have a favorite, favorite quote, but I use this one when I teach a lot because it was so foundational in my sales career and really helped me get on the right track. When I was leaving New York to move to St. Louis 30 years ago to go into my first sales job, my dad sat me down and he was a big time New York City sales executive. He's like, I need you to hear this from me. I know you think you know everything, but you don't. And he said to me, sales is about making your customers successful. And he said this to me, your goal is to make them as successful as possible. And as long as your motivation is to help the customer win, you will always win in sales. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote that in my book, Sales Truth. And I teach that when I'm talking about our mentality for prospecting and selling. If, if you're really a person of integrity, you do what my friend, Anthony Anarino, who's my favorite guy in the sales industry and, and a dear friend, he wrote the forward to two of my books. Anthony says this, selling is not something you do to somebody. It's something that you do with them for their benefit. It's brilliant. Yeah. And if, if you really believe that, and as my dad said, your goal is to help the customer win. So you're always operating from their perspective with integrity to get them what they need. They smell that on you. Yeah. And because you're selling from an abundance mentality and you are authentic and you are full, filled with integrity, you don't do stupid things and they trust mm -hmm. you. And there are times you walk away and go, you know, I'm not the best fit for you. I think you should go a different direction. Or you, you ask enough questions to ensure it's a good fit and that your solution is going to bring value. And if you play the long game, really, which is what my dad was saying there, it, mm -hmm. there's nothing, there, there are no shortcuts and, and putting something over on someone doesn't win you anything. Like yeah. do this right. And that's what Anthony is saying. That's what my dad said. That quote, as long as your goal is to help the customer win, you're always going to win. That's powerful. That is powerful you know, back to that immediate gratification, we can make that mistake a lot as salespeople and play that short game and try to get that one in really quick for the end of month or that quarterly bonus or whatever it might be. But I, I think your dad is, uh, is wise in saying sales is about making your customer successful. And if we keep that mindset, we, we, have, we have now put ourselves in a position to play the long game. Mike, I got to tell you, I, I wish we could stay on all day and talk. I don't. I feel like we're having a conversation, and and uh, there's nobody that's ever going to listen to this. And this was just for me. Um, wow. I really respect the work that you do. Uh, you're helping a ton of people uh, change their life. You're helping business thrive, and so we really appreciate uh, the content you're putting out and how you're supporting people in their own journeys to success. Obviously we have MikeWeinberg.com. How else can uh, people get a hold of you on socials or anything that you'd maybe like to promote? Yeah. MikeWeinberg.com is great. And my new website is, is just about up. So there's lots of fun stuff there. Um, I'll tell you what I, what I will promote. I'm doing events for sales leaders. We're back with in-person, I call them supercharge your sales leadership events. We did three of these before COVID and they were the most fun and most satisfying days of my career. Brought about 50 executives or sales managers together from all different companies. They paid their way. And we do what really fun venues like a Porsche Experience Center yeah. or a, a conference room at next to a major league ballpark and go to the game. We're doing one in Dallas at the Four Seasons Hotel and we have a golf package. People don't want to stay the next day and play golf together. Mm -hmm. um, MikeWeinberg.com slash events has all the info, mikeweinberg.com slash events. And on social, it's typically Mike underscore Weinberg. Uh, there you go. And Weinberg is W-E-I-N-B-E-R-G, Mike underscore Weinberg on Twitter and Instagram. Listen, we got to keep the salespeople uh, energized and no better way than to get them out of their element a little bit, especially with us all going 
back to brick and mortar if that's where you're going. Some are, some aren't, but this is a great way not only to motivate your team, but to engage them with some great, great training. I've listened and digested a lot of Mike's content and being a salesperson, a sales leader, one that's carried the bag, I can tell you this is a guy that you absolutely need to follow. So Mike, once again, thanks for investing time. Listener, go uh, make sure if you're not already, subscribe to the show notes. We're going to have Mike's contact information, how to connect with him, as well as actionable questions that you, the sales leader, can share with your team. Make sure that you highlight some of the things that we talked about today so that you could be the effective sales leader that you're called to be. Until next time, I want you all to remember, you all have been set up to be champions in this life.